good morning, good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Ladies Day. No matter where you are in this season, ladies, we love you. I want to borrow a phrase this morning for one of our supported missionaries. And she always, when she gets up, she says this. If no one has told you today that they love you, let me be the first to say we love you. And on behalf of everyone here today, we love and appreciate you. Can we just thank God for our ladies? And speaking of that, yesterday we had the ladies tea and it was just amazing. You ladies outdid yourself. The tables were amazing. We had, evangelistically speaking, we had about 400 people there. <laughs> Maybe 300, but anyway, it was a lot of people and we had a lot of fun and it was total organized chaos. <laughs> And the steeplechase had nothing on us. We had a blast. But I do want to thank a few people this morning because I tried to get a picture of all these ladies together, the team, who we really want to thank. It was like herding cats, so you couldn't get them together because they were so busy. So I want to just say thank you this morning to these people, Jenny Lloyd, Christina Morrison, Christina Morris, Taylor Crawley, Julie Fields, Tanja Brewer, Joanna Starkweather, Lizzie Allen, Carol Sorbo, Joy Lloyd, Cynthia Cavell, Katie Mashburn, Lisa Valletta, and the glue that holds all this together, Becky Scott and Trish Harris. Let's continue in worship and let's read our Psalms 95 together and let's go in, in anticipation of what God has for us today. Psalms 95, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing songs of praise to him. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. He holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains. The sea belongs to him, for he made it. His hands form the dry land too. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. If only you would listen to his voice today. This is the Word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. This next song covers every single one of us. It says, come people of the risen King and sing rejoice, rejoice. So would you join with us as we sing together? Come people. And come people of the risen King who delight to bring Shifting shadows of 
This morning, as we continue in our worship, we're now going to prepare our hearts to gather around the Lord's table and to gather on these altars to pray for one another. And any time that we're invited to, the, to approach this table of grace, we're often so aware that we're not worthy of that grace, that we've done nothing to earn that grace, and we discover again what grace really is. And yet, we want to come to the table soberly and aware of that. And so, we have a common prayer of confession. The prayer of contrition that we pray every Sunday as a community to acknowledge um, our need for grace and to confess our sins together. And then to receive the grace of God as we approach His table. So, will you turn your eyes to the screen and, in, and join me in this prayer of contrition. Let's pray with our hearts. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Fill us with your goodness, goodness beyond what we can comprehend. And through the power of your Holy Spirit, Keep us walking in your abundant and eternal life day by day. Amen. And it's my pleasure to invite you together around this table to come receive from this table of grace. And as you approach, we will have three stations here on the floor and two stations in the balcony. And you can come forward empty-handed and receive the bread and you'll take that and dip it into the cup as you hear words of blessing from those who are serving you. And also our altar care team is coming now. And so these are people that are ready to pray for you no matter what you're going through, to help you shoulder that load, to invite you before the throne of grace. What a beautiful morning to be together. Let's bow our hearts as I ask the Lord's blessing over this, his table. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O oh Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and the blood of your Son. And sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity and constancy and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and all glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen.
Is a word.
thank you, Lord, for the gift of getting to worship you in community this morning. For the gift of getting to hear all of the voices in this space lift up. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Each of us bring our unique stories to that hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah in the midst of grief and loss. Hallelujah in the midst of just daily days where it seems like I don't know how I'm going to get through because it's just thing after thing after thing. <laughs> Hallelujah in the midst of joys beyond what we could imagine. Hallelujah in the midst of hopes and tears and fears and celebrations. Hallelujah. We lift the whole of ourselves to you this morning. The God of all gods, the King of all kings, our very creator, who also bids us to come as we are. And as that first song this morning that we sang together said, come those whose joy is morning sun and those weeping through the night. Come those who tell of battles won and those who struggle in the fight. For his perfect love will never change and his mercy never cease. But follow us through all our days with the certain hope of peace. And so for those of us who are able to lift our rejoicing easily this morning, we thank you that that is an offering that is pleasing to you and that you delight in. And for those of us who are lifting that in faith, or maybe letting others in the room, their praises lift up this morning, we thank you that that is not an offering too small <laughs> or that you don't see or that you don't delight in. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Come and have your way. We thank you for being in our midst. Always. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 What an honor it is that each of you are here in this space or joining us online to worship together. Whether you are here somewhat begrudgingly because you're here with your mother, you're here every single week, or this is your first time or your hundredth time, we hope that you feel so welcome in this place and that this truly is a space to come exactly as you are. As we continue in our worship in just a moment, we're gonna have the opportunity to walk across the aisles and greet each other in the peace of Christ. And for many of us, this can become routine, but sometimes we forget that somebody desperately needs to hear, just like Linda said, if nobody's told you, you are loved. Sometimes somebody in this room might desperately need to hear those simple words, peace of Christ be with you. And then for you to hear those back and also with you. But before we do that, I want to invite our children in grades one through six to continue their time of worship and learning in the Children's Worship Center. And as they head out joyfully, would you walk across the aisles and greet each other in the peace of Christ. Good morning, family. We are so happy that you joined us today. Happy Mother's Day, happy Ladies' Day. We appreciate all of you ladies out there so very much. You nurture us, you love us, you take care of us you take care of others. So we honor you today. We praise God for you today. We thank you for doing what you do best. We hope that you will enjoy the service today. We hope that God will minister to you right where you are. We know that he hears each and every prayer. So that means whatever your desire is today, whatever is on your heart today, he is listening. We love you and we hope that you will come see us this summer. We hope that you'll be in service with us sometime soon. God bless you. Let's go back and enjoy the rest of our service. Welcome. You've been welcomed this morning several times, but let me welcome you again.
and just say that we're so delighted that you're worshiping with us. If you're visiting with us this morning, it would be our honor if you would grab a connection card in the pew rack in front of you and fill it out with a little bit of information. You can put it in the offering bag when it passes in a few moments, or you can take that connection card to the guest connection station in the foyer after the service, and there's a team there today and every Sunday to greet you and answer any questions that you have about our church. We also welcome everyone worshiping with us online. You're a very important part of our family as well. And please let Pastor Linda know how we can pray with and for you this week. So today we're honoring mothers. It's Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. And, and my own mother is here, Diana. I'm so honored that she's here, whom I love. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. And, and we're so, but, but, but as a church family, really, we're so delighted to be just celebrating this national holiday as a church family because this is something that as a church we get excited about mothers. But it's bigger than just those who have children of their own somehow. It's, it represents a day that we celebrate all that women do for and with and through the church all across the world and, and in this church particularly. And so every, every woman that's here, we, are, we honor you today. We're grateful for you today because you all are our current church mothers and our future emerging church mothers. And so we would love on this Mother's Day to have all of the women in the room stand and, and be honored and, and in gratitude. So you, come on, y'all are being bashful. Stand up, all the women in the room. We want you to stand because we honor you. We need you. We're grateful for you. We love you. We love you. So happy Mother's Day to everyone, all the women in the room. We don't get to say happy Mother's Day to fathers or to men, but, but we'll say that later in just a couple months. So just a couple of things to mention about what's going on in the life of this church. And the biggest news uh, is, is that hopefully, if you remember, you received an email last Sunday mentioning who our new pastoral candidate is, Ben Anderson, that we're so delighted and pleased to present to you. And so a couple of things to say about that. First, there are two opportunities for you to meet Ben and his family and hear just a little bit more of his story, hear a little bit more about who he is and how he got here, and also an opportunity for you to get some of your questions answered about who he is and part of his story. So the first of those opportunities is today at 4 o'clock in Montel Hardwick Hall. So 4 to 6 today in Montel Hardwick Hall. Everyone's welcome. It's going to be a fun just kind of informal time just for you to get to know Ben and his family. There's going to be cookies and coffee and water, that sort of thing. The second opportunity is next Sunday morning at 9 a.m. here in the sanctuary. Sunday school is still going on across the, the campus, so if you're a Sunday school teacher, you are welcome to dismiss your class for next week or you're welcome to just invite whoever in your class would like to be a part of this. But this will happen 9 a.m. next Sunday, another kind of meet and greet opportunity here. And then in the service next Sunday, May 19th, Ben will preach. He'll deliver the sermon. And after he delivers the sermon, our board chairperson, Joe Cook, will come and will start a brief congregational meeting right after the sermon finishes where the congregation will have the opportunity for a ratification vote for the recommendation coming from the board of directors, the transition team, and the discerning committee to present Ben as the next senior pastor. So lots of just kind of things coming up. But the first thing is today at four, we'd love for you to join us in Montel Hardwick Hall and get to know Ben and his wife, Aaron, and his kids, Dylan and Luke and Zeke. They're a lot of fun and you'll love getting to know them. 
The only other thing that I'll mention is coming up in June is the season of Pentecost, Pentecost Sunday, and the season after that of Pentecost. We're having on that weekend, June 7th and 8th, a Holy Spirit retreat that is hosted by the Alpha class that's meeting, but, but it's open to the whole church. So you don't have to be going through Alpha to come to this special two-day Holy Spirit retreat. Details, more details on the website, church calendar. We'll talk more in the coming weeks, but go on and just put that in your mind uh, to be thinking about. So now let's pray over our tithes and offerings. Father, today we are celebrating mothers. And so, Lord, today in, in this moment, our offering prayer is an offering of thanks and gratitude and a prayer of blessing over mothers. Lord, we thank you for our mothers, those that are our natural mothers, those that those that have adopted children, had children, those that are our aunts, those that are our sisters, those that are our grandmothers, and also all the women of the church that, that care for us and that shoulder us and that pray for us and that are mothers to all of us. Lord, we pray blessing over all the women in this room. Lord, we pray that you would fill up all the mothers and all the women in this room full of gladness and joy and happy surprise in your spirit. Bless them, God. Bless them. Preserve them. Keep them. We're grateful, 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 God. We think of your mother, Mary. We're grateful for her. We honor her legacy today. We honor the way in which she was a mother to you and a mother to the whole church as well. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you give.
stand, please? Second chapter of Acts, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe come upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their numbers those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that has been sung to us in the singing of this psalm and now in the reading of this passage from the New Testament. We pray that these words would quicken our hearts, speak your word into the life of each of us individually and into the life of this assembly. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I uh, want to get into this passage in just a moment, but I'd like if you would indulge me just for a, a moment or two to just have a little pastoral chat uh, about two or three things. One, it's Mother's Day. I'm aware of that, and I'm particularly aware of it because uh, my mother is going through the valley of the shadow of death. And so... <clears throat> When the service uh, concludes, I'm going to St. Louis, uh, and I'm thankful to my family very much who insisted that I was to be here today, and uh, though I'd called Hunter and said, please be ready, um, but um, uh, they insisted that this was the place I was supposed to be. I'm thankful for their forbearance on that, and that's also the way my mother would have it. Um, I, I want to say uh, that in regards to that, my mother, like my grandmother, is a very strong person and grew up in a time where in the church as well as out of the church, uh, there was not as many opportunities for women in their personal growth and professional growth. Uh, and I, I th we're making progress on this, but Many of the denominations, uh, Christian denominations, still uh, do not permit women in ministry and some do not permit women on their boards and in leadership in any way. And I, I want to just you to think about uh, that is, um, I think, well, let me say, I usually uh, lean into tradition. I think tradition carries uh, important information from the past and traditions ought to be overturned very, very carefully and after much consideration. But this is a tradition that has no redeeming value. It causes great pain, and it also causes damage to the uh, church of Jesus Christ, and it's high time we outgrew it. Amen. This church uh, believes that and has, far be in the days far be before I came, this church, uh, Brother Hardwick felt that way as well, and advanced women in ministry and on the board and, and all those kinds of things. But there is sometimes, you know, even in our good intentions, there are uh, cultures hard to overcome. Uh, one of the things I was very thankful for is that uh, when we uh, had the, um, the, uh, the sound, I'm trying to think of the word, word in another language, uh, sondage is what we call it in French, uh, uh, the pole or whatever of the church. What do you call that? Survey. survey, thank you. When we had a survey uh, of the church, that old habits. Uh, uh, <laughs> when we had the survey of the church, um, that um, uh, w it was revealed that the majority of you were perfectly fine for us even to consider uh, a woman as senior pastor, which, uh, which is, uh, is commendable and, and wonderful. But uh, again, I'm thankful that we keep making progress in this way, thankful for the many women in leadership in our church, and particularly for uh, Sheridan Banks that led the discerning committee and has done such an outstanding, outstanding and splendid job. <clears throat> um, 
Now I want to say something about Ben because one of the regrets I have of leaving, leaving quickly after church is that I cannot make that uh, introduction formally today of him, though God willing I'll be here next week. But uh, it would have been a great privilege to do that. It's my responsibility to do that. And I, I, I'm always a little reluctant that sometimes church rumor mills being what they are, that my absence might say something about uh, some reluctance of mine or, or uh, not enthusiastic, but nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, Ben's candidacy was late in the process um, and came from nominations, uh, a, a number of congregants and leaders in our church that did not know that the others were making that suggestion. And, uh, and when I knew that he had been introduced into the process, I, I was overjoyed and I'm overjoyed now. I've known uh, Ben a long time. I've known him in formal and informal ways. I've worked with him. I have uh, been uh, his boss at one point. I've been friends with him, all those different things. I think the discerning committee has done an unbelievable job and very, very hard work. And in my mind, I don't want there to be any doubt. I believe that uh, we are able to say it seems good to us and the Holy Spirit to make this presentation to the congregations. Um, I could talk more about Ben. I love him a lot and him and Aaron and their family. Uh, I'm very moved that we've come to this point. I think there's great things ahead. God is going to do great things in this congregation. This is precisely the right family at the right time. Uh, you will have to determine that, of course. It takes a two-thirds majority ratification from the congregation, and you have every right to, and responsibility to make that judgment on your own. But those are my sentiments. So about Acts. In this passage, in Acts chapter 2, and this is kind of chatty to this sermon. <laughs> in Acts chapter 2, we are presented with a lot of material. First, it opens up, particularly in the King James Version, with when the day of Pentecost had fully come. Nobody raised Pentecostal, doesn't know this by heart. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one mind and one accord. And the next word is suddenly, suddenly a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. By the end of the chapter, which we are reading today in today's passage, we, we learned that they were giving themselves to the apostles' doctrine, persevering in prayer, uh, you know, the breaking of bread, and, and all those things. And so what I would like to say uh, today is that uh, this ending of the second chapter of Acts is the orderly life of the church and community. And it is an echo of the first chapter of the book of Acts, which I want to talk about mostly today to kind of give light to this passage. The suddenly a sound from heaven and a rushing mighty wind was an unusual and powerful surprise. But what preceded it and what came out of it was the normal life of the church. And that's what I want to talk about because when you do grow up Pentecostal and charismatic and you often hear things like, and I've said this myself in preaching in years gone by, that the early church was in perpetual revival and when the church is not in revival, it's in a black, backslidden condition. I don't think that's true. I've come to believe it's not true. And the reason I know it's not true is because revivals are unsustainable. Not because we backslide, but because life must return uh, to normal. Uh, you know, there's, it's like marriage. There's a honeymoon and there are times of, of joy and delight in one another in that kind of erotic and beautiful and wonderful explosive kind of way. But in between, you've got to pay the light bill. You've got to repair the roof. You've got to cut the grass and pay the bills. And those that don't know that and try to may act as though marriage is, is this continual ecstatic and uh, exotic kind of uh, arrangement, 
uh, the marriage usually doesn't last because they got to find a new way to rekindle that suddenly, sometimes with someone else. And this is a downside, I think, of Pentecostal and charismatic life is that this idea that, uh, that the orderly life of the church is somehow less than these powerful moments uh, where we're caught up in the presence of God in such an overpowering way we can hardly speak. Uh, so I want to talk about that today and why I believe this is true. I was surprised when I read the commentary on the book of Acts by the great uh, scholar Yarsaw Pelligan. Uh, I really wanted to see what he had to say about the book of Acts. This was the last book he wrote. He was in his 80s. Uh, and, uh, and for some reason, uh, he wrote this as his last book. I don't know why exactly. Um, but I read it and was shocked to find out he had spent a half of the space of the commentary on Acts chapter 1. And that surprised me because, again, every Pentecostal or charismatic person knows that even though formally Acts, Acts begins with chapter 1, nothing really happens of any significance in Acts chapter 2. That Acts chapter 1 is basically yada, 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 yada. And suddenly a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house. And the rest is just like introduction that's kind of a boring. And it's a yeah, 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 yeah. Bang! Suddenly. <laughs> and so I had to figure out why he spends half the commentary on, the, on, on chapter 1. And he says not... It's not only because the rest of the book of Acts comes out of this seedbed of chapter 1, but because the entire New Testament comes out of chapter 1. That's a pretty big, important statement. That the whole entire New Testament comes out of the first chapter of the book of Acts. Why does he say that? I've got four things about that, and I really hope to leave you with something really important today for the life of our church. The first thing that happens is that the, Jesus continues to teach his disciples a new way of reading scripture. Uh, we, we are introduced to this new way of reading scripture actually in the last chapter of the book of Luke. Luke is the author of the book of Acts and of course the gospel that bears his name. And in the last chapter of the book of Luke, uh, uh, Luke tells us that the res resurrected Christ meets with his disciples and begins to teach them those things concerning himself in the word of God. And so the Lord is beginning to give what we call hermeneutic, a new hermeneutic to the scripture. That's what changes the Hebrew scripture into what we call the Old Testament. The Old Testament and the Hebrew scripture are precisely the same book, except it's read through a different lens. And why, what kind of lens is it we read the, uh, the Hebrew scriptures through if we're Christians uh, is contained in the, some of the few statements Jesus makes. He, for example, he tells the Pharisees, you're always looking in the Bible. He said, you're constantly searching in the scripture. He said, because you think, he's being sarcastic, you think that you're going to find eternal life in there. He said, but they testify of me. And then another occasion he says, you're always talking about Moses, but he said, Moses saw my day and he was glad of it. <laughs> well, these are astounding statements to make. And so we're beginning to see, well, how are we to read scripture? And, as, and we, we see right away in the book of Acts chapter 2, the apostle Peter preaches his, the first sermon in the, in the Christian church and he uses the Psalms in a way we have never heard the Psalms used before. Namely, that the Psalms are about Jesus. When you read the Psalms, you're either reading prophecy about Jesus, you're reading prayers that Jesus prayed, uh, or you are, you are seeing lessons uh, that connect to what Jesus taught in the way that frames our own internal life. And so Christians necessarily read uh, the Psalms and the whole corpus of, the, of the, the, the Old Testament in ways differently than our Jewish friends. It doesn't mean we can't learn a lot from them. In fact, I do. I read an awfully lot of Jewish commentaries. 
But we, we have some parting in the ways in the way that we see things, for example, like Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him, uh, and by his stripes we are healed. All we have, like sheep have gone astray, but the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Well, who is that talking about? We, we cannot help but see that that's Jesus, and, uh, and it's impossible for us not to see and because in some ways, Jesus, he actually says that of himself. For example, Psalm 23, which we have heard sung now today, and is one of the readings for, appointed for the day. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. It's one of the uh, first Psalms that we, uh, that we ever memorize. Who did Jesus say that was about? I am the good shepherd. And so many times, you know, we see statuary, particularly in, in, in graveyards of, of the Lord with the sheep, because Jesus said, that's talking about me. I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. Oh, when you read the Lord is my shepherd and you know that Jesus is your shepherd. Today as a choir was singing that I was thinking about my mother and I'm like when my mother, uh, uh, finally enters that haze where she can no longer see us and talk to us in those moments or weeks or whatever it is in that in-between time to where she's between here and there. She's not going to be alone. The Lord promised her that. I'm going to go with you through the valley of the shadow of death. You're not going to know any evil. And I've got a rod and I've got a staff and I want you to be comforted by that. You're not to be afraid. Isn't that wonderful? Hallelujah. So the Lord... The Lord teaches us how to read the scripture differently because it testifies of him, not only the New Testament, but the Old Testament. Secondly, Jesus closes the era of the incarnation to begin the life of the spirit. And he starts this a little early, right before, as he's headed toward the crucifixion, he's, he says, I'm not going to leave you orphans. He said, I, I, it's, I'm, I've got to go away. But he said, it's for your good that I go away. Something good is coming. He said, and, and the Holy Spirit is coming. The Father's going to send you the Holy Spirit. He's not coming in full power and glory until I go away. But when I go away, he's going to come in full power and glory. And it's going to be a different era than this era, but it's going to be a good era. He said, because the Holy Spirit is going to be with you, he's going to be the comfort, the, cons the consoler. And he said, and he will bring to mind those things that I have taught you. Right? It's about the Holy Spirit. He begins the life of the Spirit. And, and an awful lot of the church world that seems not to know that the, uh, that the, uh, that the uh, uh, life of the Spirit has come, that we've entered the life of the Spirit. Uh, many, many times, and this is true throughout hi Christian history, particularly in Western Christianity, they begin to, they, they don't know what to say about the Holy Spirit. Um, that, you know, there's a, that, that the Holy Spirit kind of, you mentioned the Holy Spirit in the formulas, you know, and now may the blessings of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whoever he is and whatever he is, you know, be with you. Because, you know, we depict Jesus on, the, on our stained glass. We've got, we've got, we've got all kinds of uh, pictures and statuaries of Jesus. But what do you do though the Holy Spirit? You, you know, we, we, do we just make a picture of oil? Or uh, sometimes we do a dove or a burst of fire or so forth because he's the uncontainable, unpredictable, divine, un, divinely unpredictable uh, uh, power and person of God that comes among us to stir us up and to change us and to take us to new places and guide us and console us and all those kinds of things. Very difficult to get an image of that. But Jesus told us, uh, I am, I'm going away. And he said, and, uh, and I, will, I will see you again in person when this whole thing concludes. But in the meantime, the spirit will be with you. And he says, I want you to go to Jerusalem and then Jesus ascends into heaven. And the angels, the angels are, are you know, because they're, they're there looking into heaven. And the angel says, well, this same Jesus you've seen go will come again in the same way to receive you to himself. For right now, you do what he told you to do. You go into Jerusalem and you wait for the Holy Spirit. So those, are, those, are, those two things happen uh, in, the, in the first chapter of Acts. The third thing that happens in uh, the uh, first chapter of the book of Acts is the church's leadership structure gets established. Now this is where you have to realize that in some ways our kind of frontier evangelical Christianity has missed a real point here. Because um, 
Uh, Judas has betrayed the Lord, and so he's out. He's killed himself, as a matter of fact, and that's talked about in the first chapter of Acts. Uh, and they said it's necessary to fulfill his, to fill his office. Well, we think, well, you know, you got 11. 11's a lot. That's a lot of guys. You don't need a, you don't need a 12. We're, we're good. But, but no, the Lord Jesus had appointed 12, and they felt, they, they felt constrained that this has to be filled, and uh, this, this place. And so they begin their own search. They begin a discernment process like, like we have done, and they set up the criteria. And the criteria was uh, somebody had to have been with the Lord. Somebody had to be eyewitnesses. They had to be with us from the beginning. You can read all that in the first chapter of Acts. And they came up with two, two people. So that tells you they might have been in one mind and one accord uh, a little bit later, but right now they're divided on what's supposed to give. And, and uh, I don't know, I, I, love, I love the King James Version because of such colorful phrases you can never get out of your mind, but I like it a little bit later. It says, and no small dissension arose among the brethren. <laughs> Has anybody ever been in a church where no small dissension arose among the brethren? <laughs> Uh, you know, because, you know, when, when we get in arguments, we're not just saying, well, this is my opinion, that's your opinion. Each of us have God on, their, on our side, and the other people clearly do not. They have fallen into the lap of Satan, and they, uh, I, I, in the, when the King James Version was being translated, uh, uh, there's, there's a wonderful book about this called uh, As Wide as the Waters. One of the translators working on this project wrote to the other, and they were in a disagreement about how a phrase should be translated. And these were some of the greatest scholars of all times, and all of Europe gathered together, but nonetheless, they were human beings. And one of them wrote to the other and said, Dear vomit of Satan. <laughs> well, let brotherly love continue. <laughs> We've, we've outgrown those kinds of infantile kinds of uh, feelings since then, and the church is much more peacefully and bliss, blissfully united, uh, fortunately. But the church leadership structure was being uh, formed. You had these two candidates, and finally someone said, well, I don't know how to resolve this, but they were going to have a united opinion, and they agreed to roll the dice. I mean, we don't see that they did it any other time after that. Well, my grandmother said, well, probably was a pointer that you, you, you spin. They wouldn't have used dots. Well, I, I don't know, but it said they cast lots. Whatever that means to them, they were like, uh, you know, heads or tails. Uh, oh, it's you. Uh, you. The hand of God has come upon you. Uh, it would be interesting if we just kind of did that by random selection these days. But it wasn't just random selection. It was random selection after, a, after criteria had been set and there were two evidently equally uh, uh, qualified candidates. One's name was Justice and the other one's name was Matthias. As an interesting aside, St. Matthias is uh, buried in Germany. He is the only apostle buried uh, north of the Alps, which means he disappears from the record. And a lot of times I've heard people say he probably didn't do a thing. They, they, they wasted their time. No, uh, he probably uh, just felt the call of ministry and went far, far away in what was then very barbarian territory and spread the word of God. But it's important that our leadership structure gets appointed in a church. Many times we, don't, we, we just don't take enough time to, to uh, make sure that we realize that the gifts that God has placed within his church are not all things like glowing in the dark and levitating. I would like to see the gift of levitation dispersed in our church, and the two people that had it, I would be very impressed, and I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want to cross them too much because they would be surely anointed to do things that are absolutely spectacular and wonderful. But then we have to remember the story of Balaam, who had wonderful and powerful prophetic gifts, and yet the scripture said he was dumber than the beast that he rode upon. <laughs> and, that's a, and, that, and that is a, a purposeful point made by the Bible, because many times these spectacular gifts we have, we, we, we think that that means that that person has all kind of wisdom and biblical knowledge and all that, and many times it doesn't. People have spectacular gifts. We, get, we thank God for those gifts. But uh, God has not put all of his gifts in one person, and we need one another. And some of the things we most need at, at different times in our church 
our gifts of administration, uh, gifts of organizing, gifts of uh, people that do things that are kind of alicite, out of mind, and numbers of us were raised to think are not really that important gifts to the church. But according to what I'm saying today, in, in uh, Acts chapter 1, those were the gifts now that were working. And the Apostle Peter declared, these things have to be taken care of. And I don't think a suddenly from heaven would have occurred without them. So look around our church, our, our ushers, for example, or our Sunday school teachers that are out uh, now many times not even in the service today, or our musicians that spend, some of our musicians uh, are in front of us and they, uh, they perform and that's their gifts and they do very well, but there's also those behind that are doing charts and are arranging to get the people together and, uh, and are making sure that the, the choir gets their coffee and stuff and, and, uh, and organizing the parties and things that are necessary for building community and so forth. Those two are a part of what happens on Sunday morning when they open their mouth and suddenly a magnificent sound fills the whole congregation. Right? I'm not trying to uh, do away with the fact that the church needs a suddenly. A church needs revivals. A church needs to be quickened. A church needs that spectacular, supernatural, unexplainable sound from heaven that leaves everybody in awe and amazed. But I don't think we get there. And I know that what's gained during revivals are not sustained without these other kinds of structural gifts that work alongside of and, and in preparation for and afterwards to just keep the church going in the way that it's supposed to go. And I'm hoping that we are mature. I, I have lived in revival communities my entire life. I've been present in one of the greatest revivals of all modern times in Latin America. We baptized 10,000 people in a year. I've, I've, we were sending out finally the ushers and Sunday school teachers to be pastors of congregations that were springing up overnight. It was holy chaos for a long, long time. Uh, and I, I, it was wonderful, I appreciate it, but I know that's not the norm because also a lot of really crazy things happened during that time. And as things thus begin to settle, God sent teachers and administrators and the people that would now mature us in the faith. There is nothing to be gained with a church that's in perpetual revival if no one really is learning the scripture, learning to balance the church checkbook, learning to use their vocation in a way that God's called them in the, to bless the world somewhere. There is no art. There is no science. There is nothing coming out of that place except just people in continual ecstasy waiting for the coming of the Lord. The entire corpus of scripture says that's not the way the Lord wants to bless the world. He empowers us with the Holy Spirit so we will be empowered to do the work he's prepared us to do. And to do that work, we need training, we need equipping, and we need organizing. Amen. Well, the final thing that happens in, in the first chapter of the book of Acts is the entire community that's been around Jesus is regathered. So there are, of course, the 12 apostles. But everybody, does everybody know that the Lord's ministry did not begin with the 12 apostles? It began several years before, about 30 years before, with that group that we celebrate usually in the, in the Advent and Nativity in the Lord's family. And his mother had continually, she shows up from time to time in the gospel story, but we don't hear a lot from her. And there's a couple of times we think he's almost dismissive of her. Uh, but now we're found, finding out, Luke says, and when... And uh, as they gathered, now they had done all their work, and now they began to enter into prayer and to and prepare spiritually now for this suddenly from heaven. He said, the Lord's mother is there. Now that's certainly purposeful and pointed. Like Hunter was saying earlier, there's in some ways that we have some mothers in the church here that are dear people um, that that we love because they've walked before us in integrity and godliness and, and uh, for a long, long time. Um, and, uh, and you know, uh, you can only imagine what the early church thought about the mother of Jesus. So it's kind of like she's there. This is an official meeting. The mother of the Lord is there. 
It doesn't say that the brothers of Jesus are there, but I suspect they were simply because suddenly we see in the book of Acts again the Lord's brothers who were dismissive and trying to get him to go home because they said he, he may not be well mentally right now and we're going to kind of get him to go home at early on in the Lord's ministry. That's what, that's what brothers might well say of a brother that's out preaching and doing something right. Well, you know, he always was a little excited. Let's, let's get him home. And now uh, we know from what Paul says that the Lord had appeared to at least one of his brothers. And James, uh, the soon-to-be leader of the church in Jerusalem, that was in his own right regarded by the Jewish people uh, so highly they gave him in his lifetime uh, the title Tzaddik, which means uh, well, something like we do saint. Uh, it's somebody, a holy person. Um, uh, he had met the Lord. Paul said that the Lord had appeared to him. And so now the Lord's family is there. The 12 apostles are there. The 70 people that God sent out uh, to uh, evangelize and proclaim the kingdom of God uh, are there. In fact, Justice and, um, uh, and Matthias came from their number. And so the entire uh, kind of uh, core corpus of the, of, the, of the church is gathered around Jesus. And so chapter 1 comes to an end. And then chapter 2 opens with that explosive beginning. Suddenly a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Now we're in new territory. 3,000 people are added to the church in a day. It's powerful growth. It's wonderful growth. But in the meantime, underneath all of that, there are people scrambling around and they are organizing. The deacons have to be brought into, uh, into the mix and they are formed. And all of this is going on. And we see the orderly life of the church that's going on in both before and then immediately after and sustaining the powerful growth of the, of the presence of God and the spiritual moment that has now come. So let me, let me conclude with this. Here's what our church is. I mean, a lot of this really says about our church because we had a long foundational era in our church. Our founding era was very long and very powerful, and it had a culture of its own that was very distinct and, uh, and very pronounced, and that tweaking it in any way was nearly a sacrilege. And so to equip a church for a very uh, new era and a different day and a new society with new, new issues and a new generation and new peoples from around the world to tweak what had been a wonderful founding era to be responsive and effective in our era was a colossal, colossal task. And uh, it, it, it hasn't been completely done yet, but it's been largely done. And so what I suspect this God is doing right now is he's been preparing us where we've kind of concluded our uh, Acts chapter 1 moment. A new generation in our church is assuming leadership. Not just a new senior pastor, which is a, a new generation, but also all across our church, we are blessed like many churches are not blessed with a group of people now that are young leaders that are now experienced, they are wise. They love us. They don't want us to go away. They, they care for us. They, they don't say, now here's your rocking chair for the rest of your life. We get to coach them and love them and appreciate them and be their greatest cheerleaders. And now watch them take this church to a very new era filled with power and glory and growth. Oh, you know what a great privilege this is? Do you know how few people get to see this? One of the great blessings that God gives to people in the Bible, he says, you're going to see your children and your children's children. Isn't this wonderful that we've been able to see this moment? I believe we're going to see the greatest moments of our church ahead underneath the leadership of a wonderful, sold-out, godly group of young men and women who are, uh, some of them not, not that young anymore, but that's another thing. Uh, 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 you know, as you get older, they're all young. But this is our moment to be enabled. And many times we don't have the church. The church doesn't have the grace for an older generation to say, you know, your time has come. We want to support you now. 
It doesn't mean you go out to pasture and all that. But many times there's a lot of anger and a lot of resentment and so forth. That's not in our church right now. There's blessing and joy and delight. And because of that, there's the favor of God on the church. So, Mother's Day. The Apostle Peter tells us that and metaphor, that the church is our spiritual mother, or maybe it's Paul, that the church is our spiritual mother. That's been abused in history before. It's like, you know, you better obey your mother. <laughs> but the, mother, the mothers are, are about nurturing and making sure the family, the family is formed. There are many times there are men who are uh, great forces in forming the family and making sure the family is formed well. That's been the case in our family for sure. But also, also the, the mother's role is unique and primal. There's something about the mother's presence in our life. For most of us, there are times where that's not a wholesome thing, and people need great healing from that. It's one of the primal wounds of life if your relationship with your mother is somehow uh, not well. But, but mothers, mothers are like, it's, you see these movies where the mafia guys, you know, uh, they're, you know they're, going, they're talking about later in the day, they've got a job to do, they've got to go out and dump some guy, you know, in the, in the bay with semen around his uh, feet or whatever, or do something that people in that occupation, I guess, have to do. But then that, but it's time to eat. And so they're talking, talking, and the mom comes out, and she's got the apron on, and she's like, sit Time to eat. And they're all those guys like, whoa, whoa, they got machine guns and everything. But they sit down and eat and said, you're going to be kind to each other. It's, you know, it's spaghetti night or whatever. And so everybody like, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Because it, and it's just, there's something about that when that, that voice creates community and sometimes keeps us from doing those egregious things that we would otherwise do in our kind of runaway exuberance a male energy and, and so forth. And that's what the church does in our life. The church, the church is, is dysfunctional because human beings are dysfunctional and that's who the Lord left the church with. <laughs> and so we always are kind of pulling it together. We've got this thing going, that kind of thing. We've got rumors going. We've got, we've, you know, sometimes the money isn't there. We've got, and, and it's just this constant kind of things that, that early on we think when we really are oh, under the, the glory of God and the peace of God and everything is as it should be, this will be a wonderful and peaceful and all this stuff will go away. But that might be, but in the churches I've served, it hadn't happened yet and uh, now I'm getting along in years. So uh, it's likely that it's always kind of a little messy. But can we nonetheless see in its best moments, like today, as a choir is singing, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of the life. And we watch old and young come together here to receive from the Lord's table and receive prayer from one another, people hugging one another, people being kind. How many of you, many dozens of you today, how's your mom, all those things. That's when the church is mothering, caring, and that's why our spiritual life requires it. And that's why for this to happen, we have to care for the church. Not just that spiritual abstract entity in our mind that's without spot or wrinkle and blemish or any such thing, but the institutional church with all of its blemishes, flaws, and downsides. It has to be cared for and loved, cherished and supported. That you have done. And now it has come to this moment, and I am concluding. I want to say to this church, we are in a good point. We are in a good and blessed place. As much as humanly lies within us, we have done this process the right way. It has, there has been a very small amount of politicking or anything or someone behind the scenes getting their way while nobody else gets listened to. The process has been long. It's been tedious. People have worked really, really hard behind the scenes getting us to this place. And we have had a suddenly, in the last few months, and, and the candidate said, who, who, me? Are you serious? Uh, well, I don't know. Let me think about this. And the reluctant candidate began to pray with his family. And, in, and, and, and so not knowing whether he would say yes or not, 
And even if he did, that may not be the right person. The group continued to do a lot of work for a long, long time. And then little by little, the Lord began to show this group and then, and then our transition committee that had been set in part to kind of vet their choice and then the board and now to you. We have seen, we are able to say it seems good to us in the Holy Spirit to, to come to this moment. And because I feel the peace in the congregation and because I feel the sense for the most part and I, I don't know any, any um, uh, exceptions to this, a sense that, yeah, this feels pretty good. And the more and more people know, the, the better they feel about it. This tells me chapter 1 is concluded. The church is ready for us suddenly from heaven and a mighty burst and a new work of the Holy Spirit in our church. We are ready for a great dispersion of the gifts of the Spirit and we have the fellowship and the ability and the unity to, with, to, with, to hold the kinds of gifts and power and growth that God wants to give. Would you stand with me, please? Lord, I thank you for this congregation that in my adult life, since 1984, this congregation has blessed and sometimes hurt me. It has helped me develop and sometimes... Uh, led me to hit a wall. Uh, there's been pain. There's been joy. But I can say that this congregation has at crucial moments allowed itself to serve as a mother to me and to my family. And you have allowed me to serve it and to care for it. And I, being a human being, have made many mistakes. But alongside, you have also brought great numbers of very effective and very wonderful leaders. Not only those that preceded me, not only those who were my peers, but now in the last few years, the most wonderful group of people 20 and 30 years younger than me, upon whom the grace of God has settled in some spectacular ways, who are united among themselves, and who have great tenderness and care for those of us that have borne the burden in the heat of the day. I thank you for this church. And I thank you, Lord, for uh, Ben uh, and, I, and for his family that you have brought to this point. And we pray now that as the discerning process continues and now we, uh, as a congregation, uh, decide what we're going to do with this nomination. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would lead us well and that you would lead us with joy. And we pray, O oh God, that this church would lean even further into the role that you've called us to be of creating family, loving community, in which your presence is known and manifested, whether it's a suddenly from heaven as a sound of a rushing mighty wind where we're struck down on the floor, staring at, and, and with awe up to the ceiling with great healings and miraculous powers and all those things that we love to see. If it's in that kind of season or the seasons of where we just faithfully feed the hungry and care for the dying and bind up the wounds of those who are hurting and sometimes those things happening together, however it pleases you for us to serve the world around us and the community in these walls, we now ask you, Holy Spirit, to help us fully grasp that you have inaugurated a new era of blessing and joy and fruitfulness for this church, and we give you glory for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace.